magnetic torque lab, and this is our apparatus. Uh, the way it's set up is you got all your controls here, you got your ammeter here, you can control the current with this knob right here, uh, which is important because this current flows through the Helmholtz coils, so two separate coils, and they produce a magnetic field. When you have the gradient off, field gradient off, they're going to produce the field in the same way, which means the current is moving in such a way that it's going to point up or down, which you can adjust here. And then you can see we have an air compressor over here, which shoots air up right here and gives this cue ball here a little bit of an air cushion, which allows us to bring the friction more or less to zero. And I'm going to let Colin explain the cue ball now. All right, so I'm Colin, and uh, so this cue ball is just a, uh, a solid plastic ball with a uh, little magnet in it with its uh, uh, moment pointed in the uh, up direction. And so the cue ball will sit here on the air and will, as Matt said, be more or less uh, frictionless. So when we can, so we can actually make a bunch of experiments by uh, just moving around, making this cue ball do different things under the magnetic field, and uh, basically this tip here will is where we're going to be, what we're going to be using to calculate most of our uh, our periods and our uh, frequency of oscillation. Okay, and so for um, for this experiment, there's two ways that you measure the value of the magnetic moment of this cue ball. And uh, before we get started on that, you got to take uh, a gauss meter here, and you want to place this, you know, more or less in the center of where the uh, cue ball would be in relation to this apparatus, and measure what the magnetic field strength is as a function of this current here. And that will allow you to not have to use the gauss meter for the rest of the experiment. Um, and so the way that we do this is we know that the torque that's placed on this ball because of its magnetic moment is equal to mu cross V. So if it's pointing up like this, you got the up direction and you got the uh, B field in the up direction, then you know that it's going to point this way by the right hand rule. So if we displace this a little bit, it's going to experience this torque. And the way that this ends up looking, um, in the actual experiment is you displace it a little bit from the vertical, have some sort of current, and it'll oscillate like that. And so what it's doing is by being displaced in one direction or another, it's got a torque pushing it that way and then a torque, a restoring torque, which overcompensates, throws it to the next side, and we can measure this period and through some crafty hand waving and uh, equations, calculate the magnetic moment based on that. And so then, uh, Colin's going to explain to you the second method, which is a little bit more complicated. All right. So the second method, as uh, Matt explained, is a little bit more a little bit more complicated because what we're going to need to do is we're going to actually need to uh, give this give this baby a little bit of a spin to measure its. Uh, to, to measure basically the angular velocity here. And uh, on the ball, right here, is a little duct. And what how we so what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna we're actually gonna spin it and then we're gonna turn on this strobe light here. And uh, it's it's hard to actually show this on film, so but it's gonna be it's gonna be turned on and the light's gonna flash. So we're gonna have the lights off. But so the the light's gonna flash, and when it gets at the perfect at the perfect frequency, at the, when the strobe gets at the perfect frequency, the little pin, a little dot on that uh, on the tip, will actually look like it's frozen, and so that means that it's uh, it it is matching the frequency of, of oscillation, or it's or a mode of it, like. It could be two. To, it could, the ball could actually be rope spinning two times or three times faster than is uh, shown by the light. So at the end, you're going to have to do a little bit of crafty uh, 
crafty handiwork on that to make it so it looks like, so it does everything. And then after you do that, you get to take this little doohickey here, which is just basically where you're going to uh, measure the start and stop, and then you turn the gradient field off. And see, as you can see, now it's going to precess around. And when it, when it gets all the way back, that is one period of the per procession. And so you, you measure it with the, uh, you'll measure it with the clock, and so it'll start there and stop there. And then after that, you want to me actually measure this, uh, measure the uh, angular vo velocity again, because, of course, while seeming frictionless, it is actually going to slow down. And so, and so you're, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to take that, the previous one and the one at, and the second uh, measurement, and actually make uh, take an average of the two. So then you want to do this for multiple. You want to do this for multiple uh, currents going through, which will, of course, change the speed of the procession. And what you can what you can usually do if you're fast enough is uh, if you're if you're fast enough, you can actually take the angular velocity that you measured for the previous uh, measurement and apply it to the same one because it's still spinning around. At this should be spinning around at around the same speed, but it's just going to have a different uh, procession time. And so that'll make your uh, that'll make your measurements go a lot quicker, be a bit snappier about that. And uh, so usually what you're going to have is you're going to have one person just manning all these controls and the other person just sitting there taking down data so you can get things going, get things moving. All right, and uh, those are the two measurements you're going to need to uh, for the second method of, uh, me of measuring the, uh, your mu value. All right, and uh, my lab partner is going to explain secondary observations. Okay, so there's a couple extra little things you can uh, observe here that are kind of neat, uh, mostly relating to the right-hand rule. Um, so one thing, as you look at it right now, it's spinning clockwise, and the B field is in the up direction, and so by the right-hand rule, you know that omega cross B equals big omega. So now that we got the gradient off, it's going to rotate around now. So if it's going clockwise, then it's the um, the axis of rotation. Sorry, is pointing in the direction of this little knob, and the B field's pointing up. So you can see that the force on it is going to be nope. Okay. Okay. So wait, the axis of rotation is actually pointing down, and the B field's pointing up. So it's going to make it rotate counterclockwise. And if you flip the B field into a different direction, then you can see it starts to rotate the other way. Um, and then if you spun it the other way and gave it a different angular velocity, all of those, those observations would flip. Um, and so, and as you can see, like maybe if you observe now, as this spin angular momentum starts to slow, the precession starts to slow as well. And that's just agrees with all the equations. And um, and then if you uh, increase the magnetic field while this is doing it, it's also going to speed up. So you know that B field increases or decreases period of time, increases velocity. And um, aside from a few little right-hand rule mistakes there, that is how you do the magnetic torque lab.